Hey everyone, Brian Zane here with another classic pay-per-view review as nominated by my Patreon backers. Now before I begin, I want to address the elephant in the room. Now if you saw my Money in the Bank review, you saw this little mark on my forehead for the first time. People are asking in the comment section, oh, is it a zit? Did you get married in India? Is it a blade job? All I can say is that headbutts from a toddler are a bitch. And speaking of naughty language, it's ECW time. We're going to look at ECW Heatwave 1998 from August 2nd at the Hera Arena in Dayton, Ohio. This show was nominated by Ags Connolly over on patreon.com slash wrestling with regret. And I want to preface this review by saying I tried my best to get the, you know, the authentic ECW viewing experience. I know uh, last year when I reviewed Guilty as Charged 2001, a lot of fans criticized me because I used the network version of the show for my reference. I didn't go back and watch an original one before all the songs got dubbed over and whatnot. So I'm okay. I'm going to try and watch, you know, a version from Pioneer Entertainment. The the, uh, the distributors of the ECW tapes and DVDs back in the day when they were first around. So I found a copy of Heatwave 98 on DVD from Pioneer, and it turns out it's actually worse than the network version because they cut out all the intros, there's no music playing, the crowd dubbing, if you can believe it, sounds even worse than what you might hear on the network for a show like this. We don't get anything in between matches, we barely get promos. So a lot of this pay-per-view is really stripped down on the, the original ECW DVD. DVD. It actually, the runtime is about 20 minutes shorter than the show on the network. So yeah, I mean, just looking at my options, I'm like, you know, I think I'm going to get a, the better experience watching it on the network. Dub themes be damned. I get the idea. I get who, who I get the RVD comes out to walk by Pantera. But anyway, this show was the fifth heat wave event in ECW history overall, but it was the first one to air on pay-per-view and the first pay-per-view they ran out of the state of Ohio. They would return to this very same venue the following year for Heat Wave 1999. 4,400 people packed the Hera Arena, about $110,000 gate, roughly 70,000 pay per view buys. Joey Styles and ECW champion Shane Douglas are your commentary team tonight. Uh, Shane is out of action with an arm injury at the hands of Taz. More on that later. Like I said, one of the things that I didn't like about that ECW DVD that I got to watch this was it cuts out a lot of just talking. Like there's, you know, Joey Styles is the big entrance, he welcomes the fans, and you know, Shane Douglas comes out in the network version and they talk some stuff, but in the DVD, that's all cut out. Like Joey Styles says, welcome, and they go right to the intro and they cut anything else that happens out. Now, I might understand why they did that in the DVD version, because what you see in this introduction is Shane and Francine come out. Uh, Joey Styles makes a joke about Francine's breasts, saying, oh, my suit's double-breasted like Francine. And then she responds by shoving Joey's head into her chest, and his cell job is great. My favorite part about that is as it transitions to the opening uh, package for the pay-per-view, you hear Joey, he's still, the mic is still hot in the arena, and Joey, the sound he makes is pretty hysterical. Your opening contest here is the Summer Series Finals between these two as Jerry Lynn goes one-on-one -on -one with Justin Credible. Now, of course, Credible has an entourage with him. He's accompanied by not only Jason, the sexiest man in the world, who looks kind of like Buff Bagwell's older brother, you also have Nicole Bass and Chastity. Now, I, I was surprised, or I, was, I forgot, that Nicole Bass actually worked for ECW for a spell before she went over to the World Wrestling Federation and had a, bit, a, a cup of coffee there. Chastity, I also uh, forgot about her. I remember her being in WCW shortly after her time in ECW. She was booked as Raven's sister in kayfabe and then pretty shortly after uh, she was hired, they fired her because apparently standards and practices discovered, oh, Chastity had been in a pornographic film. So we can't have that in WCW. That's the one thing I remember about Chastity was that she was a valet, she was in porn, and then she got signed and fired by WCW for being in that porn. The action begins with some arm drags, some chops. Jerry gets clever right off the bat with a corner roll up and a cross body. Great fast pace sequence off the ropes, ending in reverse DDT by Justin. A big running knee in the corner with a chair assist as Chastity distracts the referee. I've never understood this from watching the old ECW when you've got these distraction spots, the referee's turned around. Now we're going to cheat. I thought the whole MO of ECW was like, nothing's off limits. You can do whatever you want. I've 
I've sure I've certainly never seen an ECW match and a disqualification before, or a count out for that matter. So I'm not sure why they even have to go through the motions of distracting the referee to do the dirty to do the the cheap dirty thing. Justin's working over JL. He goes for a top rope axe handle, but he gets hit with a reverse atomic drop in the landing. Credible is back on the offensive though. Lynn with a huge sit out power bomb to begin his comeback. Jerry goes for a hurricane rana, but Credible catches him with a power bomb. A chair is brought in. Credible sets up something we don't know, but JL counters it and DDTs on the chair. Chastity helps Justin make it to the ropes. Fighting on the top rope, Jerry with a big ass hurricane rana off the top to the outside and through a table. JL goes to the cover in the ring, but Jason attacks the chair. Jerry hits the tiger bomb on Jason. Nicole Bass runs in, puts him on her shoulders. Jerry gets down, hits a low blow and a chair shot. Uh, Justin grabs Jerry and Chastity goes for the dick kick, but Jerry jumps up, so Chastity kicks Justin instead by mistake. JL grabs Chastity, hits the tombstone pile driver to a big pop. Jerry signals for a Frankensteiner up top, but Justin catches him and hits the tombstone from the top rope. Justin wins. I give this one three stars out of four. I think for an opener, it was very strong. Uh, it was very fast paced, almost to a fault. I think all at times, the speed of which they were doing stuff in the ring almost worked against them. But I think, uh, of course, that's just kind of emblematic of the time and the style they're working. I think it was, you know, very well done match to get the fans excited. And so, yeah, a great way to start and uh, very hard to top. Up next, former tag team champions do battle as Lance Storm takes on Chris Candido. Earlier in the year, Candido turned his back on Storm. Lance was kicked out of Triple Threat and replaced with Bam Bam Bigelow. And so they feuded for months up to this point. Uh, Candido brings out his fiance, Tammy Lynn Sitch, aka Sunny, for this match, which was a big deal because this show took place four days after Sunny was released from the Federation. So, of course, this is, of course, back in the time when people were going from company to company. Every move was a big deal. So for Sonny to make that move was, yeah, it was a pretty big deal for ECW, pretty big coup. But when she introduces Chris in this matchup, ooh, she sounds like she's seen better days. You know, I think everybody here, Mr. Ortiz, thinks that I can do this better than you can. We get some grappling action, Pepper with some punches early on. Storm gets Candido in the corner and removes Chris's protective headgear. That's not necessarily a reference to Rick Steiner, that headgear. It's actually protecting his ears because some months earlier, he had his ear actually severed in a match with Sabu and was repaired with plastic surgery. So still very tender according to the commentary there. So how will he, I love that Joey Styles says, we might see that ear fall off live on pay-per-view. Wouldn't that be something? Candido with a dive to the outside. Back in the ring, Storm is tripped up by Tammy. He chases her around the ring, gets back in the ring. Candido with a running power bomb. Storm with a super kick. Candido kicks out. We get a power slam by Candido and a kick out. He puts Storm on the apron. Storm fights back with a huge suplex to Chris out of the ring, which never looks good. A baseball slide by Storm and a big springboard plancha to the outside. Chris goes up top. Lance catches him in a huge superplex. Top rope spinning heel kick by Storm and a kick out. Storm pulls off that springboard back elbow we saw him try and do last time on the review segment here against Chris Jericho. After that move, Chris goes over to Tammy at ringside who produces a bag full of white powder. I'm totally not going there. So he has a handful of powder. Lance bops his hand up into his own face. So uh, Chris is temporarily blinded, takes out the referee. Another super kick by Storm. He goes up top, but Sonny gives him a caress and a shove. Crotch first into the turnbuckle. Now while Storm is selling that stuff, she and the referee get into some shit. The referee grabs Sonny by her dress for some reason. Seems kind of out of character. Chris rolls the referee up by mistake because he's still blind. Blinded, and because his his hand is holding onto Sonny's dress, it comes down with him. So we get what looks like a big wardrobe malfunction uh, with Sonny and everything. And one of the security guys has to take his jacket and cover Sonny up with it. Sonny is like frantically checking her nose the whole time for some reason. You know, maybe that white powder has something to do with it. In the chaos, Candido finally gets his wits about him and hits Storm with a top rope power bomb, the blonde bombshell, and fuck that bump. That that whole move in general, the top rope power bomb, is a scary proposition to begin with. But to see Storm hit that and go back head whomping on the mat that made me just like wince in pain uh seeing that i oh my god i don't want to see that bump ever again so candido wins the match uh, on that i also give this match three stars out of four i think you know, like the just incredible jerry lynn match from earlier i think it's a very well done match the chemistry between these two is just superb as someone like me who hasn't seen a whole lot of chris candido work in the past this is a 
great window to seeing what he could accomplish in the ring. So if you're like me and you haven't seen too much of Candido's stuff, this is a great place to start. However, I, I, I also rank it three stars like the Credible Jerry Lynn match because as good as the match is and as well done as it is, it's not like a match where it's like, wow, that's like the most amazing match of all time. So it's like it's a very, very good match. I wouldn't put it in four-star category, but it's definitely up there. We cut to a segment that was recorded earlier in the day. New Jack is hanging outside the arena with a bunch of ECW faithful. He's cutting a promo on Jack Victory, who he's supposed to be wrestling tonight in a weapons match. Jack Victory shows up. They have a face-off, and all of a sudden, the Dudley boys come rolling up in this red car. They just jump out of the car and start beating up New Jack. It's a big old brawl. Balls Mahoney and Axel Rodden also get involved to try and break it up as well. Jack gets got and is unable to compete in that weapons match because he's beat up so badly. Yeah, New Jack, the guy who always comes out with all these weapons and does unspeakable things to himself and others in the ring. One shot being thrown into the car, and boom, he is unable to compete in this weapons match. Uh, the visual at the end of the segment with, uh, it was a wild beatdown. Uh, the segment itself was just pretty wild from beginning to end, so it was a well-done bit. But the, the visual of Axel Rotten, you know, cradling New Jack in his arms, you know, calling for help, it's a surprisingly kind of sweet, sobering moment uh, in this segment here. It does, it's a lot better done than, say, the Sandman looking over Tommy Dreamer and calling for a beer. We get a backstage promo by the ECW Tag Team Champions, Rob Van Dam and Sabu. Their manager, Bill Alfonso, opens things up by screaming at the camera, directing his ire at what he calls Japanese superstars. I don't care what you call your Japanese losers. You're losers tonight, daddy. I call it right down the middle. RVD putting himself over quite often at Sabu's expense. By the way, Sabu in a suit is a weird look. Uh, he actually kind of pulls it off, though. And then uh, RVD makes a couple references to his one of his opponents tonight, Jinzei Shinzaki, at one of his former gimmicks. We got the two top guys from Japan. Akuchi! Bless you! I'm getting a bit of feeling of deja vu over here right now as Mike Awesome takes on Masato Tanaka in International Warfare. These guys carry over their feud from FMW over in Japan. Uh, awesome showing his agility early on with some work in the corner and his strength by catching Tatanka in midair. Awesome clotheslines Tatanka to the outside, dives right out after him, eerily reminiscent of a spot we saw last time on this channel, but with a lot less awkward commentary by Joey Styles. He follows up with the top rope clothesline back in the ring. Tanaka's back on the offensive and he produces a chair. He runs Runs all the way up the ramp, then all the way back, and uh, clinks awesome with the chair on his run back there. On the outside, we get a bit of a chair sword fight. Those are always fun to see. Awesome dumping Tanaka into the crowd, and then holy shit, a springboard dive by Awesome to the outside, over the barricade. Now granted, they pulled the barricade uh, several feet closer to the ring so we could clear the barricade, but still, holy shit, Mike Awesome doing a springboard anything is very impressive to see. An awesome bomb in the ring and a kick out, a big ass splash off the top, another kick out. Mike with a big old chair shots to Tanaka's head and even back then he wasn't selling shit. The chair is just absolutely destroyed at the hands of Mike Awesome hitting Tanaka in the head with it. A top rope chair shot. Douglas, who's on commentary for this match, is screaming at Awesome to pin him. You got him beat. We put him away. Whatever. But Awesome's not listening. He's not doing that. He wants to put more damage on Tanaka here. So he sets up a table on the outside. He's, he makes a couple of attempts at the Awesome Bomb, but Tanaka keeps fighting his way out every time. Ultimately, Tanaka picks Awesome up himself into a power bomb and dumps Awesome right onto his head through the table and the floor on the outside. Good lord. That was... Uh, those power bombs always scare the hell out of me, no matter who's doing it. So for Tanaka to pick up a, lunch, a much larger man than him and to do that was... Whew, that was kind of nerve-wracking, but still somehow Awesome kicks out. A Tanaka with a roaring elbow, Awesome kicks out again. This time Tanaka finally puts him away with a Tornado DDT through two chairs off the top rope, and Tanaka finally wins. I'm going to give this one four stars out of four, much like I did the last uh, Awesome Tanaka match from yeah, I've kind of messed up the timeline here. I'm going back in time, and I'm kind of thinking about things I saw from the future as I'm watching 98's show. Uh, you know, it is very similar, this match, to what we saw on One Night Stand. I'm not going to hold the past Awesome and Tanaka against the future Awesome and Tanaka, though, because it's, I'm, I'm watching a different chronological order. So, still a very exciting match. Still is nonstop carnage and ass kicking, which, when done right, is a match that I can really get into. A little hard to watch at times with all those just like blatant chair shots, the head, and everything, but still just an absolutely bonkers match. Really fun. We get a promo by Taz, the FTW champion. He throws shade on Steve Austin, Goldberg, and like Tyson in this promo before focusing on Bam Bam Bigelow, his opponent for later tonight. No 
doubt about it, Cole. This is a good promo. Another backstage promo. This time, Joel Gertner is talking about the Dudley boys who are behind him. When he's done talking, Bubba Ray chimes in to talk about Tommy Dreamer. He says he was crucified for the sins of Beulah McGillicuddy. You can give your soul to Jesus, but your ass belongs to the Dudleys. What a great line. And also, holy shit, Bubba is so intense in this promo. And tonight, Tommy Dreamer, it's your cross to bear. ECW Tag Team Championships up next as Rob Van Dam and Sabu defend against the team of Jinsei Shinzaki and Hayabusa. Of course, uh, Shinzaki was the former Hakushi in the World Wrestling Federation. His biggest moment in that company was his feud with Bret Hart. And of course, Hayabusa, the Japanese legend, he's gone on to inspire so many high flyers uh, throughout the course of his career and afterward, after wrestling and everything. Uh, this was his first and only major U.S. wrestling appearance his entire career. So ECW gets the nod for that. This is the result of the partnership between ECW and FMW. So those talent come over to ECW for this show here. RVD is the TV and the tag team champion. He's been a TV champ for about four months. He's four months into his 23 month reign as television champion. Uh, he and Sabu are reluctant tag team partners here. They've been feuding on and off since 1996. They actually beat Lance Storm and Chris Candido for the belts uh, earlier in the year. And that's how we got here to this match. The match begins with Hayabusa and RVD we get a botch from them early on and the fans let them know it. Shinzaki tags in and there's a hell of an Irish whip reversal into an Inziguri, a nice praying rope walk as well. Sabu and Hayabusa in the ring now, two guys with very similar pants styles. Uh, Sabu's got Hayabusa in a camel clutch. Van Dam with a very unnecessary backflip into a drop kick. You could have done so much more, you've been so much more effective if you just didn't do that flip at all. Uh, Shinzaki responds with a springboard attack of his own and a dive to the outside. Hayabusa with an acai moonsault to RVD and Sabu on the outside. Sabu with a dive of his own into the first few rows. RVD with his spinning leg drop over the barricade. They get ready for a double team move with Sabu on the top. Alfonso throws a chair up to Sabu, but he doesn't quite get it. Ah, oh, come on, Sabu. You're usually so good about this. So he gets down, picks up the chair, and then they've got this kind of double team move where RVD's got Shinzaki in a Mexican surfboard, and Sabu comes crashing down with a chair. That looks pretty painful. We get a kick out. An awesome barrage of flying attacks by what Bill Alfonso would call the Japanese losers. I do like the little lunge Sabu does on the outside trying to stop Hayabusa at one point. Nice little detail by Sabu there. Big top rope Hurricane Rana by Sabu, followed immediately by a splash from Van Damme. Still gonna kick out. We got a powerbomb 450 combo by the challengers onto RVD. Sabu breaks it up. Sabu puts on a Boston Crab and RVD with a giant leg drop from the top. Really it's more of an ass drop. He pretty much sits on Shinzaki's head from the top rope. This whole match is just so full of wild frenetic fast-paced double-team moves. It's really hard to keep track of all what's going on. Hayabusa and Sabu are in the corner. Hayabusa's crotched on the rope. RVD with a dropkick into a chair and on Hayabusa's face. The table they set up earlier in the match has uh, failed itself. They, uh, the legs fell out, and so they make the most of it, though, by trying to slam another guy onto the table, but out comes two or three more tables to try and do a make good. Uh, Van Dammeyer onto Jinsei. We have both the challengers on a single table. That must have been a harrowing experience, not because of the move that was about to come, but like, holy shit, I hope this table holds up this time. Big double splash by Sabu and RVD. Sabu shoves Van Dam out of the way though so he can cover Shinzaki and win for himself. Uh, this was a crazy match. I give it three and a half stars out of four. Another just insane, almost at the level of the awesome Tanaka in terms of like wild, crazy stuff happening. It, it breaks down a lot at times and slows down a little bit and I think there's like a one too many botches for me in this matchup. But otherwise, it's a really fun contest uh, with a lot of madness in there. My one question though, who's the one just throwing those belts into the ring so carelessly after the match? Like, here you go, blah! In your semi-main event, it's a false Count Anywhere match for the FTW Championship as Taz takes on Bam Bam Bigelow of the Triple Threat. Now, as I explained to you, in a very verbose hype package narrated by Paul Heyman, basically Taz has been gunning for Shane Douglas in the ECW World Championship ever since he lost the TV title at the beginning of the year. So he's been going after Shane for months, putting him in arm bars, injuring his arm, which is why Shane has the cast here tonight. At one point, Taz even tried to trick them into joining Triple Threat so he could actually get a championship match down the line, but of course, that was an elaborate ruse. This was also the beginning of Taz's time as the FTW champion, because between when he was TV champion and world champion, he was like in storyline very frustrated he was not getting the title shot he felt he deserved, so he just made his own championship and began defending it. And so the FTW title took on a bit of a life of its own, kind of got over as like a championship with some prestige, and that was kind of the stepping stone to Taz 
Taz eventually becoming world champion, but we'll get to that after this match. So Bigelow, the heavy of the triple threat, tells Taz, if you want to get the Shane Douglas, you gotta go through me first. In fact, these two did have a match a couple of months earlier at Living Dangerously that saw both of them go through the ring in a quite an elaborate stunt there. That saw Bigelow win the match. And so what kind of wild stuff are we going to see in this return match here? Bigelow with a powerbomb right away. Taz no sells it. He's still fighting. He hits Bam Bam on his shoulders early on, hits the Samoan drop. They fight on the ramp. Taz kicks Bam Bam off the ramp and into the crowd. He goes for a dive, but he gets caught. They keep fighting their way into the audience, up to the stage area. They're throwing barricades around. They're just fighting all over the place here, like taking breaks where they can. Pretty much always doing a full lap around the arena, repeatedly falling over chairs for some reason. They make their way back to ringside. Back into the ring, Taz gets a cut above his eye. There's a power bomb. Bigelow grabs the table, puts it in the corner, hurls Taz through it. There's still some table left, though. He wants to set up on the opposite end and wants to throw Taz through the wreckage of it. But Taz fights out, tosses Bam Bam with a T-bone suplex in that table. Bigelow's back on top. They make their way back onto the ramp. Bigelow picks him up for a slam, but Taz counters into a DDT through the freaking ramp. A big old Wiley Coyote-sized hole just right in the middle of the ramp there. These two guys just keep destroying the property everywhere they go. After a while of them being in the hole, Bam Bam is the first to emerge from the crater as he's making his way to the ring. Taz then comes out of the crater. He jumps, he runs after him, jumps on his back, and puts the Taz mission on. Bam Bam immediately taps out, and uh, that's the match. Taz wins in decisive fashion here after just a big old wild brawl. Douglas is hilarious on commentary at that point because he's like, he was reaching for the ropes. He was reaching for the ropes. No! He's like screaming like a super villain. He's so campy and over the top with his anger in this matchup here. He was reaching for the ropes. I'm going to give this one three stars out of four. This whole thing was just a big brawl, a huge war. The brawling on the outside was very fun at first, but after a while, I think I got a little too one-dimensional at times. It was, you know, punch, punch, punch like slam, pinfall, whatever, move 20 feet, rinse and repeat over and over again. I think if they cut their amount of time brawling in the crowd in half, or if they had just done more interesting stuff in the crowd, then I think that would have been a little more interesting. But cool story to see Taz overcoming the odds like that, the spectacular crash through the ramp, Taz winning in a big way. I think this is, you know, that was definitely one of the highlights of this show. Taz sending a message to Shane up in the crow's nest, and the franchise is just fuming. He throws a monitor down onto the floor. Taz would finally win the world title from Shane after beating him at guilty as charged in January of 1999. Your main event is a Dudleyville street fight as Tommy Dreamer, the Sandman, and Little Spike Dudley take on Bubba Ray, Devon, and Big Dick, the Dudley Boys. Not an ounce of spandex in this matchup. So earlier in the year, the Dudleys hit Beulah with their 3D and it broke her neck. It put her out of wrestling. Joey Styles on commentary, very upset about it, very subjective. He doesn't want to stay uh, straight-laced about it at all. The Dudleys come out to no music. What total heels to not have music for their entrance. Bubba's on the microphone. He runs down the entire arena. The fans, they challenge wrestlers from the Federation, or the WCW, as he said, to come out and fight. Classic heel heat. Devon says his piece. He hands the mic off to Joel Gertner, who then gives us a very long speech, where he introduces himself in lots of innuendo, as well as the rest of the Dudley clan. There's their crooked referee, Jeff Jones. There's their blow-up doll with Beulah's face on it. They call Beulah McGillis Slutty. Sign guy, Dudley, who's got a leg injury. The intro goes on for on and on and on. And, but you know what also goes on a long time? Is the babyface's entrance. Now, when I saw Sandman coming out alongside Spike Dudley and Tommy Dreamer to the bad cover of the Alice in Chains song, then I was kind of, oh, maybe it'll be kind of an abridged uh, intro. No, I was wrong because Sandman still got all his shit in. Short of walking through the crowd, he still did the whole get up on the ladder, get down the ladder, drink the beer, hit yourself with a beer, go around the arena, keep drinking the beer sort of thing. So, ah, they combined the best of both worlds for this intro. We actually get some wrestling spots early on by Devon and Dreamer. Don't get used to it, though. Bubba and Spike are tagged in. Spike just bumps his ass off for Bubba, including a big old powerbomb out of the corner. Bubba does give it back, though. He takes a Hurricane Rana, gets hit in the face with Sandman's beer, takes a big old face buster from Spike. Big Dick Dudley's tagged in and goes against Sandman for a while. It all just breaks down to a big fight on the outside by all six guys going out into the crowd. Funny visual where Dreamer and Devon are both carefully walking on the chairs while they're having a fight, making their way back. Like, I'm gonna drag you, I'm gonna beat you up, but first I wanna make sure we have the balance to walk on all these, these rows of chairs 
years as we are making our way back to the ring. Sandman with the ugliest Frankensteiner, Hurricane Rana, Frankensander, as Joey Styles said it here. Call it what you will, it was ugly. Sandman brings out a ladder, Spike climbs up top, a huge dive to the outside atop all the Dudleys. Sandman with a rolling rock on a Devon. Okay, we get it, Devon. There's a lot of selling. You can kind of take it down a notch. Sandman is dumped out and it becomes a big beat down on Dreamer. Bubba with a huge senton onto the ladder, crushing Dreamer underneath. Spike's back in the ring. It's a huge acid drop on Bubba. Sandman brings some chairs into the ring. Sign Guy Dudley tries to get involved, but Dreamer stops him, puts him in the figure four. Jeff Jones, the crooked official, breaks up and mocks Beulah, pile drives the uh, blow up doll, which I thought was a fantastic visual, only to get an actual pile driver from Tommy Dreamer in response. We get four guys in the Tree of Woe, the three Dudleys in the match, and Joel Gertner, and some four way drop kicks. Tommy hits the Dreamer driver on Devon, and the pin's broken up. Joey throws some more shade on commentary by saying, you know, we'll see that move on Monday Night Wrestling soon enough. They'll call us something else, though. Don't worry. Spike tries the acid drop onto Big Dick, but he dumps him outside through a table. Bubba with one of the nastiest, ugliest chair shots to the head I've ever seen on Salmon. The way it bends, just playing, bounces off his head is just, it's disgusting. Bubba goes for a splash on Dreamer on the ladder, but uh, he misses. Tommy hits the DDT on the ladder, pins and wins the match for his team. I give this one two and a half stars out of four. Technically, it is the weakest match of the show, but it's still a very entertaining brawl, fun, exciting main event match in its own way. But in terms of the action that you saw earlier in the night, it can't really compare to what you saw even just the previous match before this. After the match, Jack Victory runs in and El Cabong's Tommy Dreamer. The heel start their beat down and all of a sudden you hear some music on the network which is definitely not natural born killers it's new jack he shows up with his bevy of weapons and he helps clear house and they beat up jack victory some more and the baby faces stand tall in the end you know what makes the network version of this show infinitely better than any original ecw tape or dvd you'll ever see this show when new jack is doing his beat down they add weapon sound effects in post-production and it's amazing <laughs> My final grade for ECW Heatwave 1998 is an A grade. This is widely considered by many to be the best pay-per-view ECW ever put out. And I'd never seen it the whole way through until I watched it for this review. And I have to agree with them. Of the ECW shows I've seen, this is definitely the strongest one. And there's a lot going on for it here because, you know, there's nothing about this show that really drags. In the pros and cons, I'm just going to show the two best matches, in my opinion, which are Awesome and Tanaka and the tag title match with RVD and Sabu against uh, the Japanese contingent, but um, really every other match is good to great. There's nothing really dragging the show down. Every match is strong. Uh, my only real nitpick is the fact that, you know, just the op first two matches have the consecutive like wild finishes of like all the crazy stuff interference, and sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't, and then after those two matches, that's pretty much all out of the way, and they just kind of like get that out of their system. So the pacing of that is kind of weird. It's very front-loaded in that regard. Also, uh, you know, it's like I give it an A grade because every match is really solid. And I, but I think though, the sum of its parts is more interesting than any individual match on this show. Except for Taz and Bam Bam going through the ramp in the semi main, I really couldn't tell you one big moment in this show. It's like, holy shit, that was amazing. I'm gonna remember that forever. Except maybe for Lance Storm's horrific bump after the blonde bombshell in his match with Chris Candido for all the wrong reasons. But yeah, this show in general, very strong, very well put together. But as far as actual like iconic like mm, moments, very short on them. These matches are all great, all very serviceable. But individually, I don't think they match up to the sum of its parts as the entire show, if that makes any sense. Well, I hope you enjoyed my review of Heatwave 1998. Thanks once again to Ags Connolly for picking this show out. If you want to play a role in determining which shows I review, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have the chance to nominate classic shows for me to review in the future. Next time on the classic segment, I was really torn because I wanted to do a WCW show again, but I couldn't make up my mind if I wanted to do like an older WCW show, like late 80s, early 90s, or if I wanted to just go all out and be silly and do 2000 again. So I've decided, uh, I flipped a coin before I started rolling this. I decided we're going to start with the classic one first, the older one. So we're going to look at Chi-Town Rumble from 1989. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.